Today is Palm Sunday, and we're going to look at the scripture from the very, very first Palm Sunday when Jesus entered Jerusalem. It was only a week before his death on the cross and his resurrection, but before that, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for just the opportunity to worship and to be together as a church. We thank you for our nation of Canada. We thank you, Lord, that our names are written in the book of life. And Lord, we just thank you for your precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. You're welcome here just to breathe life into these words, to move in hearts. Lord, we're welcome just to take our lives and challenge us and change us. So we just give you freedom in this place. Lord Jesus, we honor you. You are great, and you are greatly to be praised. And we thank you just for the honor and the privilege today to celebrate Palm Sunday. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. So Matthew 21, verses 1 to 9, just talks about the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And I'll just pick it up at uh, verse 1 here. It says, as they, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus has inst had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees. What kind of trees? Palm trees, Palm Sunday. And they spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's say that. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Here the crowds proclaimed the kingship and the lordship of Jesus as he entered triumphantly into the city. But did they really understand what their praises were declaring? I'm sure at first some knew what they were saying, Hosanna in the highest. But then others probably just chimed in and kind of went on with the crowd. And I believe that they didn't understand. The word Hosanna is often thought of as a declaration of praise similar to the word Hallelujah. But it is actually a plea for salvation. The Hebrew wor root words are found in uh, Psalm 118, verse 25, which says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. The Hebrew words, yasha, means to deliver or save. And the word anna means beg or beseech. So combining that word forms together in English is the word hosanna, which literally hosanna means, I beg you to save, or please deliver us. So here comes Jesus ri riding into Jerusalem where there's this whole Roman rule and the people have been in bondage and the people cry out. This whole crowd is crying, basically. We're pleading you to save us, to deliver us. And, and you know, as he rode in to Jerusalem just over 2,000 2, years ago, today that same King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, triumphantly comes into our life, able to save, able to deliver, to bring victory and abundant living. Amen? You know, Jesus is on your side. He's with you and he's for you no matter what you're facing. Sometimes we just need to look at our problems and our struggles and we just need to look at them and we need to lift up our voice and shout, Hosanna! You're able to come and deliver and save. Amen? We need to declare Hosanna over ourselves, over our, the, the, the mental things that battle in our minds. We need to declare Hosanna over our families, 
over our health. We need to declare Hosanna over our finances. And we need to declare Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So I want to take a look at Luke's account of the same story of Jesus' triumphant entry. Because, you know, there were some people that were not so agreeable with what was going on. And they actually wanted to shut down the praise and the proclamations of who Jesus was. You know, I'm sure the Romans were wondering what was going on too. And uh, as the Pharisees are out in the crowd, they were going to basically hush-hushing things. So Luke 19, 39 to 40 says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke you, disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You know, there's always some Pharisees in the crowd, those that want to shut you down from declaring who Jesus Christ is to you. And for whatever reason, those people have doubt or are ashamed of that powerful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it really means. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, first the Jew and also the Gentile. You see, I was a very different girl before Jesus came triumphantly into my life at the age of 25. It was kind of like someone came in my life and suddenly turned on the lights. I went from living in darkness to light. Even though I was outgoing, I was very alone. I was insecure. And I was searching for purpose. I was searching for something, anything, someone to make me happy. And I was looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song goes. But when Jesus came into my life, everything changed. I felt his love and his embrace, and I was made alive, and I lived with a new hope. I lived with a new passion and a new purpose. Suddenly, I wanted everyone to know about this Jesus that radically changed my life. And I began to shout from my spirit, Hosanna, who was able to deliver and heal me. Right about that time, I changed jobs. I started working as a bike courier, and I would ride up and down the streets of Vancouver in between deliveries, delivering mail and packages. And I would begin just praising and worshiping God. And I remember the very first time that I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to share my faith. I had just finished my shift as a bike courier for that day, and I was on my way home. And I noticed that quite often there was a lady in her 30s that sat in a wheelchair across the street from McDonald's on Granville Street outside a particular shop. And I would always feel this nudging inside when I went by her. And later, uh, when I was thinking and talking to Pastor Mark about it, I, I, I just said, you know, what is that? And he said, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. You want to make sure you listen to his leading. The more you listen to the him, the more he'll speak to you. And so I got to think. And I was thinking and thought, thought to myself, I thought, you know what? I want the Holy Spirit to keep speaking to me. So, you know what? I'm going to listen to him, but I'm going to listen and obey and follow what he tells me to do. I'm going to follow his leading. So from there, you couldn't stop me. I remember that day, I, or the next day I was there, and I felt that prompting. I felt my heart beating. I got off my bike and leaned it against the building, and I went over and I talked to her. I don't remember what I said. It was many years ago, but I shared the story of Jesus changed my life. I, I shared the gospel, of the little that I knew at that time. And lo and behold, she received salvation. And God touched her, and it was just, it was wonderful. It was very genuine. And uh, I was so excited. That was my first experience, just leading someone to the Lord. And from there, you couldn't stop me. Um, I remember meeting people. I love meeting people alone. I remember when I, if I met someone alone in an elevator or alone at a bus stop, I would often just wait and feel that prompting of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes he would just say simply, tell them that Jesus loves you. 
tell them that Jesus has a plan for your life. And I would. And um, I remember one time I, I met this guy and I was riding up my bike and he was walking alone and the Holy Spirit said, say, Jesus loves you. And I said, Jesus loves you. And the guy said, pardon? And I said, Jesus loves you. And he said, what? And I said, Jesus loves you. And it was like the Lord was having fun with me. I felt like where he told Moses, take your hand out of your shirt and, uh, and put it back in and take it out and how he was healed. And it was, it was really, it was a very genuine thing. And um, it, was, it was quite funny. But anyways, um, by this time, Mark and I were hanging out quite a lot. And we would go to the TB unit at the Vancouver General Hospital. That was the tuberculosis unit. And we would pray for these patients there. And I would just start sharing about Jesus with them. Many times we would ride around the uh, south end of the downtown core, and that's where the prostitutes would hang out. And I would always just kind of hover and ride around and kind of go around and circulate and just wait for the Holy Spirit to show me who we would go talk to. And used, most often it was the male prostitutes. And um, we would approach them, and I would start sharing about how Jesus had changed my life. And then I would tug on Mark, and I'm like, Mark, go tell them about all the Bible stuff. Because at that time, I didn't know a lot. He knew tons, and I would get it going and uh, plant a few seeds and then go sick Mark on them. And uh, it was really exciting, so exciting. I remember one young man, he was like 20 years old, a pastor's kid from, I think, like Kamloops or Northern BC or something and just was lost, ended up there, and God just really put upon our hearts to reach out and to talk to him, and I remember him coming to church, and you just never know who God leads you to. You just don't know. So that was just my early days, and it was so exciting sharing Jesus with uh, those who the Holy Spirit would just lead me to share with. So I want to quickly just go over seven ways to live your faith out loud and they're pretty simple. Uh, if you want to take notes, take notes. But um, this is just, a, a, maybe there's a few other ways, but this is the ones that just stood out in my heart. Number one, you just got to be yourself. You just need to be yourself and be comfortable with your story and with your life and just how God made you to be. You know what? If you love knitting and that's your thing and you like just connecting in that, you know, hands-on kind of way, that's great if you're more of a guy's guy and you're really telling bush stories or whatever, that's okay too. You know what? Just be comfortable with your faith and be comfortable just being around people. Number two, listen and follow the Holy Spirit's leading. You know, he is so faithful. This is probably my favorite story. It's a story about Howie and Jeff. Um, and I remember I worked at, after I worked at the bike courier job, I worked at Benson Graphics, Graphics. It was an art supply store, and there was a young man that worked there. And quite a lot, you'd stand around and not do a lot of stuff. And I remember talking to him and just sharing my faith with him. And at one time, he asked to come out to church, so we brought him out to church. And, and the, the, we worked at the downtown core area. Church was way on the south end of Vancouver, like 70, 80 blocks away, maybe more. And he lived in North Van, which was on the other side of the harbor. And, I, and, he didn't have a, and he didn't have a ride, so I thought that would be so neat if we just could find someone in North Van that would bring him to church. Well, Mark and I happened to be in North Van one day, totally and unrelated, not visiting Jeff, had nothing to do with that, and we were in a restaurant, and the Holy Spirit began to prompt me in my heart to go and talk to this guy with his long ponytail on the other table. So, lo and behold, we did. I shared my faith and just, we made a connection and invited him to church. Well, his name was Howie, and Howie had a car. He had a Corvette. And you know what? Lo and behold, he came all the way to church one day from North Van through Vancouver, all the way to South Vancouver. It was like huge. It was like at least probably a 45-minute drive. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And I found out he lived from, from North Van. I'm thinking, well, you need to meet Jeff because Jeff needs a ride, and he'd like to come to church. Long story short, 
guess where Howie lived? In North Van, in the same building, right next door to Jeff. You know, and I just thought how faithful God is. The thing that was hard is, was God's got your number for both those guys, and that just that kind of freaked them out a little bit. I think they pulled right back. But who knows, a seed was planted, and maybe one day I'll see Howie or Jeff in heaven. But uh, engage with people in a natural way is number three. So number one is be yourself. Two, listen and follow the Holy Spirit's leading. Number three, engage with people in a natural way. When I talked to Jeff in, in the su art supply store, it was just normal. We talked about life. When I talked and met Howie at the, at the restaurant, we talked about food and engaged in a normal way. But an, and then at some point, I moved into having a spiritual conversation, which is point number four. At some point, you need to present a challenge and say, hey, have you been to church? Or what do you think? Or would you like to come to church? Or have you ever, do you pray? Or have you been ever, have you ever had any spiritual background? And start that conversation. You don't know what God will do with that. Number five is share your story. Stories are so powerful. And I know that each time I've st shared my story, you know what, God has taken bits and pieces of that and put those pieces deep down in someone's heart. When I share that story of what God did with Howie and Jeff, you can't deny that. That's real. It happened. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Every time I've shared my story, God has used it. Number six is present the gospel. You know what? We're all called to tell people about Jesus. We're not called to convert them. We're called to just tell them about Jesus. Don't worry about trying to convince them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. If he can put Jeff and Howie as next-door neighbors, you know what? He can move in their hearts the way he wants to move. Amen? But we need to preach the gospel. Mark 16, 15, this is Jesus' words. He, says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what? That guy you don't know next to the bus stop, the guy standing in the art supply store, the one in the elevator, whoever it is, just say something. It could be as simple as, hi, Jesus loves you. Sounds corny, but it works. Romans 10, verses 13 and 14 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? How could Howie, how could Jeff hear the gospel unless some crazy girl who barely just got saved herself, opened her mouth and said, Jesus has a plan for your life. He loves you. 2 Timothy 4.2 says to preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Back in those days, it was out of season for me. All I had was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? That was enough. I had the power of what he did in my life, and I had the anointing of God in his leading. And he moved powerfully. Number seven, so easy, plant seeds. Just plant seeds. You never know which one you plant, what's going to happen to that one. I remember uh, probably about, oh, I don't know, it was maybe seven, eight years ago, we were up in Kelowna, we were in the mall, and I went to the vitamin store. It's called GNC. I don't know what it stands for. And the guy there that worked there, he's probably about 20. He was at the till by himself in the store. No one was there. Worked full time, so he probably didn't spend a lot of time in that store by himself because I didn't see a huge lineup of people running in for vitamins. Anyways, I began to just felt that prompting in my, ho in my heart that the Holy Spirit was just telling me to share with him, and I just began to talk to him. I asked him, did he ever have, did he know Jesus? And he's like, no. And I said, you know what, at about 25, I was just a little older than you, that God came into my life and changed my life. And you know what, now I've, 
uh, you know, is from a single parent family, and now I've got, I don't know, X amount of kids I had back then, and, you know, I've been around the world and being able to preach the gospel, and God has just changed my life. And I wrote down a name of a book, and I wrote down my email and my name on a piece of paper, and I gave it to him. And the book was Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Amazing book. You can get it at Walmart. You can get it at Costco. Buy a bunch of them. Keep them to give to someone. I, I remember just last year, I bought a copy, and I sent it with a young man going back to Australia. And uh, you never know. So anyways, he said, thank you. And I didn't hear from him again. Said a quick prayer. Well, about a year later, I got an email. And he said, hi, I don't know if you remember me, but you came into my store and you shared about what God had done in your life. And you gave me a name of a book. I went out and bought it. I read the whole thing. I went on. I gave my heart. I said the prayer in the back of the book. I went and I got water baptized and now I'm planted and I, I don't know, I think it was Evangel Tabernacle or something in Kelowna. I just want to say thank you. You never know what seeds you plant. You never know. 1 Corinthians 3.6 says, I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. That's the Holy Spirit job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Just plant the seed. And you know what? God is so faithful. We need to be encouraged. We need to know deep down in our heart, heart that when God's word goes out, it will not return empty. It will accomplish what God desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent it. That scripture is found in Isaiah 55, 11. You know, a couple weeks back, as I was preparing for this message, I knew I needed to spe speak on just sharing my faith and just sharing and living out loud. And I didn't know where to start. I was kind of just in between thoughts. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was praying and thinking, and what am I going to say? And as I drifted back to sleep, I woke up. And, and the words that were in my mind and in my heart were the words, they were opening words from a silly little Christian song that just popped in my head. And I don't know if anybody remembers the Donut Man from the 90s, um, but this song that he had, it was called Good News, and there's a little preamble where there's a little herald. Everybody knows what a herald is. You old-timers will know it. Someone that goes extra, extra. And, it, and it's kind of like what we would equivalent now, breaking news, and a, you know, thing would come across our Facebook and, and basically, you know, tell us whatever the news is. Anyways, this little herald would go out, and these words in this song that open up to the song go like this, extra, extra, read all about it, Jesus is alive, and he wants to live in the hearts of kids all around the world, extra, extra, read all about it, Jesus is alive. And he wants to live in the hearts of kids all around the world. Come on, say it. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Jesus is alive. And he wants to live in the hearts of kids all around the world. And I believe, I just told my husband as I woke up, I said, I don't know what this is. And he says, honey, that's just, that's a prophetic thing. What Jesus wants, that's, an, that's just his heart. And you know what? This isn't just for kids. Jesus wants to make his home in the hearts of all his children, men, women, teens, youth, kids, the rich, the poor, the needy, the not so needy. He wants to triumphantly come into everyone's life. He wants to ride into their life and bring them victory and abundant life. You know, so just before I close, I want to take a quick look at uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And we see Jesus' interaction with sharing his faith and, and his purpose with the Samaritan woman at the well. You see, they had been on a long journey, and the, and, it, and the disciples left him there at the well to go into town looking for food. Um, and Jesus sat there. And then there was this woman at the well, and he approached this woman, this broken woman, in his humanity. He was hungry. He was tired. He was exhausted. He was very, very thirsty. And what does he do? He asks for a drink, just naturally being himself, 
asked for a drink. And then from there, we began to initiate spiritual conversation. And eventually, over the course of their, their, their chat together, he revealed to, to her who he was in a very personal way. And he basically began to, to tell her everything about herself. And so for her at that moment, the lights just went on. The light switch went on. And she was radically changed. And she drops her water jug and she runs off crying and boldly declaring who Jesus was. Just like those rocks, she began to cry out, Hosanna, the one who is able to heal, to deliver, to save. And we're going to pick up the story in verse 28. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, going preaching the gospel, fresh out of the, fresh off the boat. And she says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Today I want to ask a question. Does your life cry out? Are you living your faith out loud? Is the way you live your life worthy of that triumphant entry that Jesus made in your life years ago? Is the way that you live your life an expression of your faith, of an expression of real joy and praise to King Jesus? How long would it take for someone to know that you're a believer if they're alone with you in an elevator or at a bus stop? How long would it take for someone to know that I'm married to Pastor Mark? Hopefully not long at all. You see, it's the way I talk about my husband, the way I talk to him, how much time I spend with him. That's what would would communicate to others around me that I'm married to him. Who do you cry out Or do you cry out like that woman at the well? Do you cry out about the change that Jesus made in your life and who he is to you? Jesus lived his faith out loud. Think about it. Every single thing he did shouted out his father's kingdom and his father's will. And this is what brought him strength and refreshing and being alive. He was alive. He lived alive just like that song. Verse 31, still of John 4. The disciples come back. Here we go. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, they come back and they urge him, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You see, the nourishment that Jesus was speaking about was spiritual. Spiritual nourishment includes more than just Bible study, prayer, going to church, those good things that we do. Spiritual nourishment also comes from doing God's will from following his leading, his prompting, and helping bring his work of salvation to completion. We are nourished not only by what we take in spiritually, but what we give out and give back to God. Jesus goes on to say in verse 35, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up! And look around you. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. And others had already done the work. And now you will get to gather the harvest. You know, brothers and sisters, friends, the best thing that you can do is be a harvester for a ki- in the kingdom. Wake up. 
Look around. There are people all around you in your world, in your sphere of influence, waiting for you to just be yourself and live your faith out loud. Jesus is alive, and he wants to live in the hearts of kids all around the world. He wants to live in the hearts of friends and family. He wants to live in the hearts of your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, your families. But he needs you to make a difference. He needs you to reach out to them. You need to believe in your heart that you were called to make a difference in the lives of someone. And then you need to go and let the Holy Spirit lead you to live your life out loud. As we close, I just want to say, you know, maybe you're here today and you simply need to allow Jesus to make that triumphant entry into your life and bring his salvation and his deliverance to you. Maybe you've been living without him, and you know that there's more. Today, I want to invite you to receive him into your life and to declare Hosanna, that he is there to save and deliver you. But maybe you're here, and it's been a long time since Jesus, since Jesus has come into your life, and you've been living in silence, kind of like the stones. Maybe you've been going through the motions, but you're missing the joy. You're missing that refreshing, and you're missing the spiritual nourishment that comes from living your faith out loud and doing the will of your Father. Today, I want to invite you and challenge you to rise up and to boldly declare Hosanna to those around you. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, puts our believing and our declaring together. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you were made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Amen. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for coming in our hearts. Thank you for triumphantly bringing Jesus in our, Jesus in our lives and radically changing us. Thank you for your saving grace, for your deliverance, that you've changed us, oh God. And thank you that not only that you want to change us, that you want to use us, and you give us the gift and the opportunity of being an instrument to share your gospel to those around us. Thank you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus and he has never made that triumphant entry into your life, I just want to give you an opportunity to receive him by faith. Just repeat after me if you're here or if you're watching. Just repeat after me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died on the cross for my sins. And I thank you that he rose from the dead. And right now, I receive him into my life by faith to come and to save, to deliver and heal. In Jesus' name. And if you're here and you go, you know, Pastor Rhea, I've been a Christian for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and I've lost that living out loud life. I'm not living out live, and I want to live out loud. I want that spiritual nourishment that Jesus talked about. I just want to invite you to pray. Say, Heavenly Father, I come. I confess my sin of silence. And I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit and the name of Jesus, you would send once again 
your spirit to lead me. Give me the courage to obey and to share my faith with those you call me to share it with. In Jesus' name, amen.